network, learning from the network. Today, we're going to be starting this series that will take us all through December of looking at specific people that God had brought into the church. Uh, we're going through this study of Colossians, and we're going to see that God sends the right people our way. And how many of you can say with honesty, I'll be the first to lift my hand, that there are some problems in your life? <laughs> oh man, right, we can say that. God speaks to us and God uses us no matter the issues that are in our life. No matter the issues that are in our life. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, only two verses, verses 7 and 8. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says this. Paul says, as he's writing, closing this letter to the Colossian church, he says, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. Just before we pray, we're going to be looking at these verses in the weeks to come. Paul mentions a lot of people. He's writing to the Colossian church and he's listing people that were very important in their everyday life. And so he makes mention of them. The first person we're going to look at this morning is Tychicus. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have your word, that you speak to us, and that this morning our heart will not only be open to hear, but our heart will be open to understand, to hear your word, to cause it to change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know how many inventions were created by accident? A lot. A lot of inventions were created by accident. I want to talk to you about, I'm going to give you three uh, ones that were actually pretty amazing, and, and uh, their origin I didn't know until I looked them up. There was a scientist named Dr. Spencer Silver, and he was working to develop an incredibly strong adhesive in 1968. Actually, his, his intention was he would create the world's strongest adhesive, the world's strongest adhesive. Could you give me any idea of what you think he created as his intention was to create the world's strongest adhesive? Crazy glue? Crazy glue? Okay. Any other thoughts? Band-Aid. Band-Aid. <laughs> duct tape? Is there any, ta- is any adhesive stronger than duct tape? Of course. Gorilla tape? That's, that's kind of newer. <laughs> Cement or tar? Yeah. It, <laughs> he he's, he. Dove into this, this scientist, to create the strongest adhesive in 1968. By accident, he created the exact opposite. He created the world's most incredibly weak adhesive. He was so bummed. He was so angry that it was the weakest adhesive. Silver relentlessly, he shared his invention with colleagues, but he couldn't get traction to make it into a product. One of his colleagues, Arthur Fry, came up with the idea. He said, you know what, your adhesive is good. I want to put it on bookmarks. He was fed up with all his papers falling out of his Bible at church, and he determined that Silver's invention was the solution. They worked on it, developing a bookmark, and after they stuck notes to them, they made this invention. Post-it notes. After a successful market in Idaho, they sold the invention to 3M. And 3M began selling the post-it note in 1979. And it grew in popularity. Isn't that crazy? This was supposed to be the world's strongest adhesive. (laughs) And and it it didn't turn out that way. Here's a good one. I like this one was this one's going to excite you. This one excites me. Kenneth and Ruth and Ruth Graves Wakefield owned and operated an inn located between Plymouth and Boston, Massachusetts. Okay, they had a be- bread and breakfast, a, a little inn. Cooking and serving all the foods for the guests, Ruth went to bake chocolate cookies for the guest, but she found that she was out of baker's chocolate. 
So to improvise, she chopped up a Nestle semi-sweet baking chocolate bar, thinking that the chocolate would melt and spread into the batter. But the chocolate didn't melt and spread. It just softened. Although it wasn't what she was planning, she decided, as that mistake was, she would serve the cookies anyway to her guests. The cookies became a, a hit. By the way, uh, I'll tell you this, what the name of their inn was. Their inn was called the Toll House Inn. Toll House Inn. She reached an agreement with Nestle, whose semi-sweet chocolate bars were growing rapidly. The company was allowed to print the Toll House cookie recipe on their packages while supplying Ruth. They said to Ruth, we'll supply you all the chocolate for free as long as we can print your recipe on our chocolate bars. She agreed with that. Because of this mistake, after trying to make the bars easier to cut, Nestle decided to transform the bar by making bags of semi-sweet chocolate morsels, chocolate chips, in 1939 so she could easily make chocolate chip cookies chocolate chip cookies were a mistake that's a good mistake <laughs> right that's a good mistake oh that was exciting this is my favorite one this third one i like this one fittingly an 11 year old boy invented this cherished children's treat in 1905 frank epperson was going to make his own soda, filling a cup with powdered soda and water and putting a stick in it to stir it. He was having fun outside, stirring that soda, water, and then he was called inside and he forgot about it outside. The next day, leaving the concoction overnight, the soda froze and became the first popsicle. <laughs> Nearly 20 years later, after successfully serving the frozen treats at a ball and an amusement park, Epperson received a patent for the popsicle. It was not called a popsicle. It was called the Epsicle. The Epsicle because of his name, Frank Epperson. He named it the Epsicle. Epperson's children, because they didn't want to disrespect their father calling it the Epsicle, they called it Pops Sickle. This is Pop's Sickle. He sold the patent to Joe Lowe Company of New York, which expanded the flavors to what we now know as the common popsicle. Isn't that crazy? That's a good invention. There are many things that happen in life by accident. I like that. Those are some good things, but usually when people go through the problem of their accidents, life is really hard, isn't it? You look at your life and you see the frustration of life. You see the difficulty of life and you say, how can anything good come out of my life when everything in my life seems to be the biggest accident? This is where we find this first person in this book. Tychicus, actually, uh, in the Greek, his name is pronounced Tychicus, but for the sake of sounding funny while I preach, we're just going to call him Tychicus. But his name is actually pronounced Tychicus. Tychicus, okay? Tychicus is only mentioned five times in the Bible. Five times. That's the extent of, of where he is. And actually, I want to read those five scriptures of where he is mentioned. This first one we already read. Let's go to Acts chapter 20, verse 4. If some, if some people want to turn to those scriptures, they'll make our, our uh, progress here a little quicker. I'll turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 4. Look what it says here. Acts 20, verse 4. And he was accompanied by Sopater. Actually, this is talking about Paul on his journey um, uh, throughout Greece and Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Phyrus, and Aristarchus, and Secondus, I wonder who first this was, but Secondus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. It's just giving you, that's the only first mention of his name, is in Paul's traveling party. Who has Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21? Ephesians 6, 21. Anyone on that one? Interesting, right? 
In Ephesians, to the Ephesians church, Paul says, Tychicus is going to let you know everything. To the Colossian church, he says, Tychicus is going to let you know everything. So Tychicus was a very close comrade of Paul. He was with him in all of his journeys. Colossians we read. Who has Titus, chapter 3, verse 12? Titus, chapter 3, verse 12. Yeah, he, he mentions him one more time. And she actually said it the, the right way. Tukikas, right? I will send Tukikas to If you say it with an accent, you'll pronounce it right. Tukikas. The last one is, of Tukikas is in 2 Timothy 4.12, which is Paul's last letter. We know that Paul was beheaded shortly after he wrote this letter. So, who has 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12? I sent Tukikas to Ephesus. That's it. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. We already saw in the Ephesian church, what did he say to them? I'm sending Tychicus to you so that you would know how everything is going. Paul was in prison. Paul is in prison. And he's sending these dear people close to him. Alright, let's start on our page. Tychicus' name means fortuitous or chance. You can fill in the word chance. Fortuitous or chance. I love this because names have so much meaning in Scripture. His mother and father named him Fortuitous or Chance. And I don't know if you know, if you know what the name Fortuitous means. Many people say it means fortune or something blessing, but that's really not, not the fullness of the meaning. Fortuitous means happening by accident or by chance rather than design. Tell me about Tychicus' birth. Oops! <laughs> His birth was an oops moment. Oh man! Life is alright, and what happens? Tukikas is born. Tukikas. Isn't that, isn't that something? Talk about naming your kid. What is his name? Ah, uh, mistake. What is his name? Accident. What is his name? Not planned. Imagine going through school. I mean, Braxton, I love your name, Braxton. That's such, I've never heard that name, and I love that name so much. But imagine if you went to school, and people were like, what's your name? And he's like, oh, by accident. <laughs> or you said to somebody at school, my name is not planned. <laughs> what? This is what the Greeks were doing. The Greeks were, were naming their children specific meanings, so they named to Kikus by accident. Oh, man. Imagine having that over your life. Everybody knows your history. Everybody knows your history. Yes, hi. I just want to let you know I was not planned. Nice to meet you today. I'm here to take out a loan. I was not planned. You know, I'm here to start, start a, a job. I was not planned. Oh, man. That hanging over your head, resting over your life for so long until he met Paul. There was a salvation moment in Tukikus' life. That's just uh, uh, some essential oil. Uh, to Kikus, he, he had this e experience with Christ that revolutionized his life, that turned his mistake of life into the greatest blessing and favor. I want to go through some of the things that Paul says of to Kikus, which is in, up, absolutely amazing. Number one on your page, Paul calls him a beloved brother. A beloved brother. Beloved brother. Verse 7 eight. he says, as to my affairs, wait, his affairs. Paul's not just talking about his dealings. He's not talking about the issues of just church life. He's talking about his affairs. Paul is saying the people that are meeting my needs, the people that are making sure that everything that I've touched are coming about to happen, everything that Paul touched is now resting in the hands of Tychicus. And he calls him a beloved brother. We don't use the word beloved, right? When do we use the word beloved usually? Oh, I didn't even think of wedding. Wedding, we use that sometimes, yeah. My beloved, yeah, we use that at wedding. Usually you hear it at funerals, right? Usually you hear, that's right, at weddings, dearly beloved. We're gathered here. Yeah, we use it as, as weddings and we use it as, at funerals. The, he was beloved. You see that in every obituary, the person was beloved. Beloved, beloved. Do you know what beloved means? What does beloved mean? Yeah, yeah, he was really loved. Really, really loved. It's like 
It's a deep way of saying, I really love this person. We, we now associate it with certain events, but that's a good word. You know, uh, it's, I know it's weird to say, but try calling your spouse and then say, hi, my beloved. You know, it's like saying, hi, love of my life. My beloved. Yeah, you can, you can do it now. You can try. <laughs> my beloved. My beloved. Why was he beloved? He was beloved because of these three things. Number one is that he experienced God's love. He experienced God's love. Actually, uh, we know that for for sure. God's love is the the foundation of everything. He, He was beloved because he experienced God's love. Number two, he displayed God's love. So he experienced God's love. He displayed God's love. And three, he proved God's love through his display of being a strategic part of God's family. And that's the word for today. That we ought to be a strategic part of God's family. God has placed you, every one of you, with a specific gifting, an ability. God has placed his presence inside of you, and you are so valuable to God, and you are so strategic to his plan strategic to his church listen to this question here are we acting strategically in god's family or are we looking to be strategically cared for which one do we fall into are we looking to be strategic are we acting strategically in god's family or are we always looking to be strategically cared for the difference in mindset will determine the type of life in which we live, okay? The difference of those two mindsets. Either we become a strategic part of God's church, or we desire continually to be strategically met in our needs by people in the church. Which mindset we choose will cause us to become one of two of these, uh, uh, one or two of these things. The first one there that you can fill in is a victimized life. A victimized life, or a victorious life. A victimized life or a victorious life. If you are strategically looking at the church, looking at the family of God and saying, God, use my life. Use my life for your purpose. Use my life for your ability. Use my life so that I can be led by you. Then the events of your life will lead you from victory to victory to victory to victory. You can never lose when you give your life completely to Christ. You can never lose. If you dedicate your life to Him, give your life to Him and say, God, from this moment on, I want to know you and you alone. I want to be used by you and you alone. And I will look for ways, God, in the mess of my life to only follow and serve you and do what you want me to do. Then you will find that there will be power in your life and God will lead you from victory to victory. Yet... If we are looking to be strategically cared for, there is nothing wrong with wanting to be cared for. There is nothing wrong with wanting people to help us, people to, to, fall, uh, to, to uh, give to our life, to enrich our life. We all need that in our life. But if our mentality is that we are so broken continually and that all that we come to God continually is, God, I need. God, fix this. God, you're not doing this in my life. Then you have developed in your life a victim mentality. The mentality in your life will be so broken. The mentality in your life will be so so defeated, so so uh, uh, filled with hardship and cruelty from your own mind, cruelty from the things that you're facing. The difference comes in being the strategy of God. So we, we, we sometimes fall into that, don't we? we? We fall into this trap. But Tychicus broke that. Talk about this man. Talk about being an accident in life. He could have lived that out the rest of his life. I am not supposed to be here. I am an accident. Listen, I, I don't know Tychicus' life, but we find from his name, we find that his parents named him thus such, I bet you he didn't have the best upbringing. If you have a family, imagine a family member names you. And I know we were funny with some of the descriptions, but that's almost like naming your child dummy. Imagine the rest of your life. <laughs> hey, dummy, come here. What do you think that your family thinks of you? 
They think poorly of you. They want to remind you that you messed up their life. That you brought hardship into their, uh, into their life. And this is what Tychicus was raised knowing. My life is broken. My parents named me. Make sure they let me know that in the middle of all the craziness of life, I am an accident. And I wasn't planned. And there is nothing good in my life until he had an encounter with God. And Paul says of him, he is my beloved brother. He is someone so full of value, so valuable to my life, so valuable uh, uh, to the work of God. It's the mindset that we have. The, the title of this morning is Stepping into Strategy, talking about the strategic place that we play. I want you to know, each one of you, play a strategic place in the work of God, in the family of God. Now let's look what else Paul calls him. Number two on your page. Paul calls him a faithful servant. Now, why do, I, I find this so interesting. I want you to remember, the name here, we have it translated in, in, in verse 7 as Tychicus, okay? We have the actual name Tychicus, but the Greek word, if the Greeks are reading this letter, Paul uses the Greek word for his name, which is accident, and he gives you three descriptives of who he really is. So Paul says, I'm sending accident to you, but he is actually a beloved brother, a faithful servant, and he goes on to another one. He says, I'm, I, his name may be accident, but his life is far from accident. Do you hear that? Your name and situation may be accident, but your life is really far from that. In Christ, your name is far from that. Paul calls him a faithful servant. Now, this is interesting here. True faithfulness does not or cannot happen without the first part of the word, which is what? Faith. That's a fun word, faithful. Paul says he's faithful. He's a faithful servant. If we understand the word faithful to entail a person who is full of faith, we come to understand how involved the disciplines of faith must become in and through our life. The word faithful, we use it for so many things. We use faithful for being committed, right? We use that word specifically for being committed. I am faithful to someone. I am faithful to you. I am faithful to my spouse. I am faithful to my family. I am faithful to whatsoever. But we don't use that word properly. The word properly... Its emphasis is on faith. Its emphasis is on faith. The paragraph says, we often understand faithfulness as being there for someone. Faithfulness as being there for someone. Yet the etymology of the word, if you type in the etymology of the word faithful, it means this. One who shows the practice of their faith in everything that they do. One who shows the practice of their faith in everything that they do. That person is faithful. You know what the two words are in faithful? Faith and full. Those are the two words. If you break those words apart, they come back. This word was actually put together in English in 1305. Faithful. Meaning full of faith. Meaning full of Faith. Now, not faith meaning just belief in God. The faith that they're talking about were the disciplines that live out faith. That means they served, they loved, they gave, they honored, they cherished, they lifted up God every moment. Talk about an experience that Tychicus had. He coming from a mistake in every part of his life when he gave himself to God, you couldn't see anything else but Christ in Tychicus. You could not see anything else but Christ. That is insane. Tychicus. Tychicus served by bringing the presence of Jesus into every situation he was in. What an encouragement this was to imprisoned Paul. You see? Paul is in prison. And Tychicus shows up and says... Jesus is for you. What an incredible brother. What an incredible person that 
God brought into his church. Let me tell you, I, without naming names in this church, we have some Tychicuses in this church. We have some people who are full like this, living their lives out. Look what else he says. Paul, number three, Paul calls him, this third descriptive, Paul calls him a fellow bond servant. A fellow bond servant. Bond servant. Bond servant is someone in chains. Someone that serves by being put in chains. That's interesting. Tychicus, he goes to visit Paul. Let me tell you, I, I, I hardly believe that the Roman government would let somebody freely come in and just loosely be in the area. It's believed that sometimes when people would visit prisoners, that the Romans would also chain them while they had their visit, so that nothing nefarious could happen. Paul calls him a fellow bondservant. Would you do that? Go in prison, be locked up for the sake of encouraging now Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, Tychicus was sent so that the Colossians would know about Paul's circumstances and be encouraged. That's what he says. As to my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother, faithful servant, fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. Bring you information about what? He says, for I have sent him to you for this purpose, that you may know about our circumstances, which were what? Prison. And that your heart would be encouraged. That's dumb. That doesn't make sense, does it? So that you would know that we are in prison and that your hearts would be encouraged. Why is that? Why would the church's heart be encouraged that Paul was in prison? Okay, he was serving the Lord no matter what. What else do you think? Why would, Paul, why would the church's heart be encouraged for Paul being in prison? That's tough, isn't it? What could that be? Why could that be? Because the cause of Christ is more than worth being in prison for. What about prison should be encouraging to the church? I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Paul wrote these letters. These few letters, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they're known as the prison epistles, which means Paul wrote them while he was in prison. Okay? Philippians chapter 1. This is really good. Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. He says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, what are his circumstances? Prison. Have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Isn't that crazy? So that my, in my imprisonment, the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Isn't that interesting? Paul says, I, I am put in prison... I am put in prison, uh, and because of that, everyone in the Praetorian Guard knows why I'm here. Now, that's, that's not just knowledge of why they know. I want you to follow this all the way through. Look at verses 19 through 21, same chapter. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, and that with all boldness Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now think of this. Paul says, I am put in prison. But everyone thinks that this is bad because my circumstance is bad. If you were put in prison like Paul, wouldn't you agree your circumstance is bad? We would complain and we would have, have issue. We would say, God, there's no point for me to be here. There's no purpose why my life is a mess. There's no reason why my life is full of hardship, full of agony. And that's what we often look at. 
But Paul says, you are, I want the church to be encouraged. You don't realize. Why doesn't he realize this? Because Tychicus was visiting Paul. Saying, keep it up, Paul. We're, we're with you. God has a plan for your life. And Paul started looking and he says, I love that he says this. I want you to see this here again. He says about the Praetorian Guard in verse 13, so that in my imprisonment, the cause of the whole of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. I want you to go with me to the end of Philippians. The last uh, chapter in Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. Verse 21 and 22. Listen what Paul says. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. What? Paul is in prison. The whole Praetorian guard has heard about Paul. The guards are coming to talk to Paul. Paul is leading the guards to Christ. The guards are moving out through their workplace. Where is our workplace? Caesar's palace. Not in Las Vegas, but Caesar's palace. They're all moving out throughout Caesar's palace, and they're having conversation with household members of Caesar's, uh, people in Caesar's household. And they're saying, you know Paul is in prison. This is the message he shared with me. Those Praetorian guard are sharing the message, message with people in Caesar's house, and they have become believers to the point where the members of Caesar's house now are going to Paul and saying, tell the churches that we send our love. <laughs> oh, man. Tell the churches we send our love. Is Paul out of prison? No. Paul loses his life in prison? Yep. The gospel moved in power. That's incredible. That's incredible. What about prison should be encouraging to the church? Ah, God has a plan no matter how cruddy your life is right now. No matter how much we go to God and say, you're not answering my prayer. You're not meeting my need. It seems like my life is so full of mess. God is still working. If only we would change our eyes to see differently. To see differently. Uh, next week, Jen is going to be, be speaking. There's a quote that's on in her message. I, I'm, I'm going to quote it now because I, I like it. I know she'll mention it next week as well. Forgive me for taking her quote from next week. It's by J. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China who started the China Inland Mission. He literally gave his life to the Chinese people in the pursuit of the gospel in China. But in his prayer, in one of his journals, he, he says this, I used to ask God if he would come and help me. Then I would ask him if I could come and help him. Finally, I decided that's not right. I ended by asking God to do his own work through me. Where is our prayer? God, help me, or even God, I, let me be a part of your plan. No, no. God, just use my life. Use my life. Let my life be used by you wherever you see fit. Now, Paul says to the Philippian church, after he talks about the greatness of his life, Paul says this crazy, crazy, crazy verse that we've uh, come to know and understand. I, I like this so much. It's really hard. But he, he's writing the church and he says to them, it got to the point where Paul says, my situation, he says, I no longer care about my situation. Because he says, if I'm going to be alive, it's for Christ. If I die, I gain anyway. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Listen to this. Our situation, no matter the outline of frustration... And the outline of frustration in our situation is so varied, isn't it? The outline, we could outline bullet point after bullet point of frustration in our life. Our situation, no matter the outline of frustration, can and should be an encouragement to ourselves and to people because for us to live is Christ and to die is gain. For us to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
For us to live is Christ and to die is gain. For us to live is Christ and to die is gain. I wonder if, if Paul picked up this phrase, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I wonder if he picked that up from the encouragement of Tychicus, from the encouragement of this accident, who became this faithful, this loving, this dear brother, this servant, this fellow bond servant in the Lord, as Tychicus would encourage Paul and tell him, oh, God is for you, God is for you, God is for you, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You can hear, we have the letters the New Testament letters, especially Colossians, Ephesians, even in Timothy, we have those letters because Tychicus took them to the church, made his way to the church and said, I want to tell you how great God is and what God is doing through Paul being in prison. That's incredible. We're reading these letters because of a brother who loved God and was faithful, full of faith. Let me read this moving forward moment. You are so full of value and worth. Let me say that again. Some of you have a, have a broken self-esteem because of your situation in life. You are so full of value and worth. Start looking at your life and realize that God has placed you strategically where you are. Step out by faith. God has placed you strategically where you are. Step out by faith. Don't let the accident of your life define your life. Don't let the accident that people have placed over you define what you will do. Step out. Step out. Realize that Christ has done something in your life and He will lead you all the way through. That only happens through the touch of Christ. That only happens through the touch of Christ. In just a few minutes, we're going to have communion together. I want to encourage you. I, there, I want to pray for two specific things in our, in our life. The first one is this. Maybe you, you, you haven't fully made Christ the Lord of your life, ruler of your life, and you're struggling with that. I'm going to ask, just for a moment, we're going to pray for two groups of people. If, if everyone can, I just feel God is, is speaking this. If everyone can, just bow your head and close your eye just for a minute. Close your eyes just for a moment. <clears throat> if you have not made <clears throat> Christ be the control of your life, and you are living life just for yourself, and haven't said, I have accepted Christ to save me of my sin, to deliver me from eternity in hell and to give me life, <coughs> then Christ is calling for you this morning. If that's you this morning, without anyone looking around, if you say, that's me, Pastor, you need to pray for me that I would accept Christ into my life, just lift your hand and put it back down and we'll pray together. Awesome. Awesome. Let's pray. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask us if we can all pray this prayer together because the Bible says if you believe in your heart that God has, that Jesus died for you and you confess it with your mouth that you will be saved. Let's pray this out loud together. Lord, I receive you into my life. I thank you for dying for me. I believe you did that. I release my life to you to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are in life now and you feel that you are so overcome by your situation, you are so broken by your situation that you can't see past that, then God needs to remind you this morning that He has placed you strategically where you are. If your situation seems too difficult to bear, just lift your hand. I want to pray over you. Yes. Let's pray. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that each person that's responded to the hardness of their situation, Lord, you, you do not give us, your word says, more than we can bear. But God, you always provide your grace and your mercy to go through what we're going through. 
each person that's responded, Lord, I pray that you help them, Lord Jesus, reveal in their heart, in their mind, God, that you have a purpose for them to play. This life is not over. This life is not over. But God, that you would use them for a greater purpose. I pray, Lord, that you help them to see exactly what you're doing in their life and what you're using them for. Lord, have your way in and through them. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to have communion together. Who can partake communion? Anyone that has received Christ in their heart. If you have received Christ in your heart and believe what he's done for you, then you are welcome to, to have communion with us. I'm going to ask, Mark, do you mind, would you pass that around? Thank you so much. If you would take one and hold it and we'll share this together. Before you peel it, just realize the bottom is the bread and that's what we'll peel first. The top is the juice. you're able to <clears throat> peel that bottom one take that bread out i love this so much the impact of what christ has done for us it's the symbolism of what he's done the power of what's there christ's body was broken for us so that we would have life i love that his body was broken for us and paul says as he received from the lord that as often as we take this We remember his sacrifice until he comes, which is soon, isn't it? Christ is coming soon. And we remember the sacrifice that he did for us. Let's share the bread together. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus shed his blood for us so that we would be forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? We can just ask Him to forgive us. And the Bible says He is gracious and willing to forgive us. I love that. Jesus, as He took the cup with His disciples, He blessed it. And He said, This cup is a new covenant in My blood, which is for you. As often as you drink it, we remember His shed blood that gives us life. Amen for that. Let's share the juice together. Lord, I thank You of what you're doing in in and through this church, for your love that's for us, that you will never leave us, Lord. You will never abandon us. But God, that you are for us and you have placed us strategically to know you. I pray that this week, Lord, you will renew our mind. You will renew our heart. God, that you will do mighty and new things in and through us as we receive from you. We trust you, O Lord. Have your way in and through us. Bless this church in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God is for you. Has a plan for your life. Is doing great things. Keep us, uh, keep us in prayer this week. We're praying for you. Keep me in prayer as I plan uh, 